I have got the best router mortising jig in the world, and I dare you to prove me wrong. Welcome to Workshop Essentials. I am very fortunate in that I've got lots of ways of cutting mortises in my workshop. I've got a couple of domino machines these days, and I've got a hollow chisel mortiser. But I've not always been so well equipped. And when I started 40 odd years ago, I'd got a mallet and a chisel and a little tiny router. I built several router jigs for cutting mortises. The first one was a Bob Wearing design. And then I started thinking, oh, I could make this a bit better. So I added a few niceties like travel stops and a positioning stop. And I did actually publish a design for that in Workshop Essentials Volume 2, I think, which is about 14 or 15 years ago now. It worked very well in the sense that the end result was as good as any routed mortise. But I have to admit it wasn't elegant. You really needed three hands to set it up and it used two fences. So your fence rods were very long and it made it a bit unwieldy. Effective, yes. Pretty, nah, the jury's out. And then I got other ways of doing it, and so router jigs fell by the wayside a bit. But there are times when a router jig is the best way of cutting a mortise. A few years ago, I saw um, a video, and I think it was by Fine Woodworking, but I've looked for it recently, and I cannot find it. And that jig used a groove in the back, and the router fence was deep, so then it ran in the groove. And that way, you only needed one fence rather than two. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. If I incorporated that into a jig with my own design for travel stops and clamps and whatnot, I would have a world-class leading jig. And so that's what I've created. It works very nicely. It's accurate. It's easy. It's robust. And quite frankly, if, if I'd only got this to cut all my mortises, I would not be unhappy. So if you'd like to see how I made it, stick around. Now, is that good or is that good? I'm going to start with the baseboard and this is what holds it down onto the bench. And how long you have it will depend a little bit upon your bench. Um, you've got to work out how you're going to hold it down. You can't really just hold it down with clamps like that because these will get in the way for anything more than the shortest of work pieces. So that's no good. So one option is to put it between dogs, like that, and that works very well, obviously you're limited to working up here, for some strange reason I don't actually like working at this end of the, end of the bench very much. Uh, the other option is to use holdfasts, so the reason I've made it this long is so that it can go there and it lines up with two of my dog holes for the hole fasts. And these are brilliant. I should have bought these years ago. And Mr. Lee Nielsen isn't paying me to say that. That's not going anywhere. The next piece is the top block, which measures about 70 by 50. That's two and three quarter inches by two inches. And I've put a piece of aluminium T-track in there. The T-track must be flush. Or if it's not flush, it can be fractionally below. But you don't want it even the tiniest bit proud because if you do, the router will tip and you'll get a wonky mortise. So I've marked the centre of that. I've marked the centre here. And that's going to go on there. I'm going to screw that in place from underneath.
This is the front panel. I'm cutting two shallow grooves to take the flange of a sliding nut. I've got a problem with my saw at the moment. The outbeat table has become proud and my workpiece catches on it. I need to sort that out pronto. The slot for the flange nut is made by dropping on. I have a stop block clamped at the rear of the table and the workpiece is held firmly against that before it is lowered onto the spinning cutter. The second stop at the far end ensures that I don't cut too far. I'm doing this in several stages, taking just a few millimetres at a time until I break through. Nearly there! On this jig I can mount the workpiece vertically if I want to. This is handy for floating tenon joinery. So I need two embedded nuts for this. Actually I've marked these out from the wrong side so I need it with four embedded nuts rather than two. But actually that was a fortuitous mistake. I can see now that there may well be times when I need to mount mirror image components in opposite positions. I've drilled two millimeter holes right through to mark my positions then 13 millimeters on one side deep enough for an M8 nut and right through at 8 millimeters for the Bristol lever. The groove for my fence is made by simply screwing on another piece like that. And you'll notice that I've turned the plastic faces of my fence over so that they are proud. Now if you haven't got plastic fences then uh, simply screw one to it, or a wooden one. I did actually make a, one of those white um, plastic, you know, ultra-high molecular weight pieces for this, and I can't find it. It's not in the box, I don't know where, but that slid really nicely. But these do quite well as well. It's just that they, they don't protrude. They protrude about a quarter of an inch, six millimetres or so, um, which is enough, but not exactly generous. Right, so... There's a piece of masking tape on to give me just a tinsy winsy bit of clearance. And that goes in there like that. We'll just square the end up. Oh, bang on, Steve. There we go. And the last one over here. So that's what we're looking for. Slides nicely. No play. There's a front support block which is held on with a Bristol lever and a flange nut, like this. So that goes in the groove at the back. It goes through a hole in there. And then the whole block can be moved up and down like that to support different sized work pieces. The travel stops have got a square key let into them and that runs in the slot of the T-track. It does two things, it makes it slide smoothly and it stops it from twisting. Now you could have it without, just plain, but when you clamp it up there's nothing to stop them doing that and if they can twist they will twist. So that keeps them sliding nicely and they don't twist at all. So when you tighten them up they stay square and they're rock solid. The pressure pads are made from bottle tops. If you intend to use small section stock, you might need smaller bottle tops than these. Take a piece of MDF and drill a shallow hole the diameter of your bottle top. And then drill a 6mm hole right the way through. Fill the cap with epoxy or hot melt glue, insert your thread and use the indent to line up the thread. A bit of tape stops the whole thing from going solid. 
then a leather or rubber pad completes the job. The toggle clamps are attached to these two little pieces of steel which slide into the T-track like that. And you can either leave them loose enough to slide or you can fasten them up with, a, with an Allen key. But they will tighten themselves as they clamp up against the workpiece. The positioning stop is just an L-shaped block with a slot in it because this has got to move up and down according to the thickness of your sacrificial base as well as left and right. So we'll just slide that into the T-track. Like that. And it just gets clamped in place. And it still can't twist because it's hard down on the base here. So now that we've made this jig, let's set about using it. Okay, so this is the, this is the setup. The front bed moves up and down. Just lock that off somewhere arbitrarily. And I'm going to put in a sacrificial piece underneath uh, as if I was doing a through mortise. And the stop is adjustable for height on the, depending on how thick the sacrificial piece is. And that just gets held down there like that. Then the workpiece goes in. And that needs to be flush with the top. So we adjust the height roughly there and here. So this needs to go down a wee bit. And that needs to come up a little bit. There we go, nice and flush. And let's say we want the mortise to go somewhere between about there and there. So we arrange it so that that's roughly in the middle. And then my various work pieces, let's say there's four table legs, can go in exactly the same place. Time and time and time again. That's all locked off nicely. The setting pin allows me to set the router on the centre line of the mortise, like that. So now we move the router to the front end of our mortise, like that, and set the front travel stop up to the base of the router. And set the back end like that. And before I set the travel stop, I've got to put the dust extraction port on because this stop on this particular router hits the, plan, uh, the cam for that before it hits the base. So that can now move very nicely between the two ends of the mortise. Then we set the mortise depth. So if we set it to about that much, which is about three quarters of an inch or so by eye. And now we're ready to make a cut and see how it comes out. Now, is that good or is that good? I can, if I want to, mount this bed vertically. Remember these four embedded nuts? Well, that goes in there like that. And that can go in there like that. I 
And you do have to adjust the toggle clamps differently because we're not using a, um, a sacrificial bed here. So that comes up there and you do have to snub them as well. Otherwise, um, they just drop out the bottom like that. lever there we go and so now we can cut a, a mortise in there for um, loose tenon joinery or floating tenon joinery and it works just the same it's really good actually I'm really pleased with this jig So there it is, my ultimate router mortising jig. If you cut your mortises with a router, I hope you will consider building this jig. And I'll leave a link to plans in the link in the description. If you make it up, please let me know. Send me a photograph. And I'll be delighted to see what you make of your version of my jig. Thank you very much for watching. Until the next time, enjoy your workshop. Cheerio.